Hi everyone, uh, thank you for coming uh, to our talk, Bug Hunting in Distributed Systems, Using Robustness Tests to Test Your Code Better. Uh, so if you're familiar with distributed systems and you're working on projects which are meant to run on distributed systems, this is the right place for you. So uh, who recognizes this picture? Anyone? Yes, this is the famous Shibuya Crossing here in Tokyo. And when the signal goes green, everybody, uh, the pedestrians, they uh, try to cross the road from every direction. Seems very chaotic, right? Or is it actually synchronized? Similarly, for distributed systems, uh, distributed systems are uh, supposed to handle the traffic coming from uh, different endpoints all at the same time. And ideally, it is able to do that without erroring out. It, is, it does seem chaotic, but under the hood, it's all synchronized. So a little about ourselves. Uh, I'm Orko Shah, working as a uh, software engineer in VMware by Broadcom, and contributing to uh, HCD, and responsible for downstream releases of HCD and Kubernetes. And I'm Henry. Uh, I'm working as a DevOps engineer at Swisscom. And I'm currently also contributing to etcd, and I'm working on the uh, 5G automation tooling team uh, in Swisscom. So before we start, we would want to extend a special thanks to Benjamin and Marek, who has been maintaining the etcd project and the robustness test, along with other maintainers. So in this session, we are going to cover the overview of distributed uh, system testing, introducing robustness tests on the hunt for data inconsistency, the demo, and the key takeaways. So let's start with an overview of the distributed system testing. First, we need to know what are distributed systems. Uh, it is essentially a multi-node cluster or a database whose nodes are to be periodically synced so that the information is available on all the nodes. So in case of strict serializability, when two users request the value of, say, x, the request can go to two different nodes. But the value that is returned should be the same value x equal to 1, as we see in the picture. An example of such strict serializability is etcd, which is essentially a key value store that uses raft consensus algorithm under the hood to store and serve requests without breaking the consistency. Etcd is a critical component of Kubernetes cloud infrastructure. And just as the image shows, although it is a simple key value store, it is very essential for the Kubernetes cluster to function properly. And at any point, if etcd fails, the entire infrastructure fails. So now that we know that uh, what distributed systems are and how it is required to be consistent, let's see how we can write tests to ensure the same. The challenges that come with the distributed system is it's hard to reproduce, and uh, simple and common errors that can happen due to network latency or hardware failures, uh, they, they are also hard to reproduce. So, we are familiar with the traditional tests, but let's see how those are not enough for uh, doing testing for the distributed systems. So first is the unit tests, uh, which we have all written at least once in our coding career. It is focused to test a specific function and ensure whether the function is giving the correct output for a given input. Similarly, integration test ensures that the function, when working together uh, gives an expected output for a known given input. No, among not so traditional uh, testing is fuzzing, where we introduce random inputs. Uh, sometimes it can be garbage values, sometimes uh, to see whether the function holds true or it errors out. It is more focused to make the function fail rather than address hardware or system failures that are very common. Uh, thus, none of the traditional testing can reproduce a network flakiness or a hardware failure, which is very essential to actually test the consistency of our uh, project with, that we are um, 
writing for the distributed systems. Now over to Henry. So thanks, Arka. Uh, I will be introducing the uh, robustness test where we are basically on the hunt for the data inconsistency. So as Arka has introduced, uh, fuzzing basically generates uh, invalid, unexpected, or random data uh, as input, and it might be guided by a cold coverage tool to continuously mutate the input. And the goal is mostly attempting to crash the system instead of uh, trying to check the output. So in comparison, what we are trying to do here is about generating valid input, applying to the system, and checking to see if the computed output is actually correct. And since the uh, randomness part now needs to be valid, uh, we then have to more or less define or scope what goes into constructing the input. Um, there are mainly two categories that we uh, consider uh, is the data and also like the execution environment. So for data, we might have different operation types like read and write. Uh, we also have different payloads, like for read, we'll have to supply a key. For write, we'll probably have to supply a key and a value. Uh, for operation patterns, we might be something like read heavy, write heavy, a mix of both. Uh, for execution environment, things like uh, disk failures, uh, network packets being dropped, or even the whole network is being black holed. So that's the randomness uh, that we might be doing uh, with the test. What's the motivation for us to build this test suite? Um, as you know, etcd is the backbone of Kubernetes, and there was once an issue where the Kubernetes can actually report different pod status for the same pod. This is a very serious data inconsistency issue as this can render the cluster unusable and it's very hard to reproduce at the time using the existing tool with etcd. And there is basically no way for us to kind of reliably reproduce the test and uh, reproduce it in a way that we can use it on all future commits and releases to check that things, uh, the fix uh, didn't uh, get broken again. So this mm, left us wondering how we can actually reliably test and have the confidence that the bug fix is correct and is always in place. Uh, this table documents the issues that we have discovered and fixed since the introduction of the robustness test two years ago. And as you can see, there are things like crash during the high load or we have the watch traveling back in time after the network partition. Uh, you can definitely write a uh, integration test with the exact steps to reproduce the issue, but you cannot really write a test that generates the input of similar pattern and uh, try to check against the system to see if the issue will surface again. So that's actually the main point of us doing this test, uh, robustness test suite. And most of these issues that's up here uh, will uh, be run against all the commits and all the PR to make sure that the same regression doesn't happen in the future. So as you can see, getting a key value store that sounds very simple to work properly is actually quite hard. Uh, it requires some sort of continuous effort to support the development. And circling back to the question, how do we reliably test and have confidence? Uh, this is our approach to it. So a quick recap um, of the methodologies that we have described. Uh, unit test and integration test. We care about the input. Uh, it's fixed. Uh, usually it's like fixed value that you supply in the beginning, and the target is usually a function, and the output we also care. Usually it's also fixed value that we just do direct comparison, and the runtime is usually a process. For fuzzing, the input is uh, random, and usually it's garbage value. Uh, the target is also a function, but we don't care about the output, more or less care about if the uh, process crashes or the ses uh, assertion has been triggered. Uh, for the robustness test, we are doing random input, but we are doing it with the valid input. And the target is not the function anymore. It's the entire system, and including the supporting system, like the networking and the disk. Uh, since we care about the output, but validating the output against the randomized input is hard, so we're going to spend the rest of the speech more or less on this thing. And you can uh, package your test uh, depending on your need uh, in process, container, or virtual machines. Uh, before we dive into the implementation, we will quickly discuss a state-of-the-art testing framework, which is Jemson, that's developed by Kyle Kingsbury. Uh, it's a framework that basically validates the distributed system safety and correctness, 
such as like database queues and consensus algorithm. The problem for us uh, is that it's written in Clojure, and it requires very deep domain knowledge to set it up and understand uh, and to tune and understand what's actually going on with the test report. It's not really designed for the CI uh, to run on every PR, every commit, or on a nightly basis. And since the Jemson test actually tests from an external standpoint, so the system that being been tested against is like a black box. So it lacks the ability for us to extend it with uh, internal data structure checks, which for us, like we need to check if the revision actually is actually still increasing after compaction, this kind of very specific things during the test, we cannot do with the Jemson suite. So yeah, let's hand it back to Arka, where he will bring us over with the uh, robustness test implementation. Thanks, Henry. Uh, so before implementation, when we say failures, what are we actually talking about in the broader sense? So there are expected failures of a distributor system, which uh, it is susceptible to, like network delay, uh, hardware flakiness, and all that. Next comes the kind of failure which are operational and happens during periodic maintenance, less often than the expected ones, uh, like upgrades, downgrades, change in the membership, or defragmentation. Then comes the types of failure that require in human intervention to fix it, which are, again, not so common, uh, is like when the cluster becomes unrecoverable, or there is a network partition or a network a migration that is happening, or sometimes when the storage becomes unavailable. Then comes the last and final type of failures, which are the rarest of the rarest, like silent data corruption, CPU memory corruption, or network packet uh, manipulation, which are very much human intended ones. Uh, but we still want to capture these kind of failures and uh, replicate it as a part of our robustness tests. So now that we have seen the kind of failures that we concern ourselves with, let's look at the high-level architecture of the robustness test framework that is designed to replicate these failures. <coughs> First comes the input, also known as the scenario, followed by the setup of the cluster. Then we record the output and we uh, validate those output as a part of the test. Uh, so I'll be covering the input and the setup stages. So let's look at how input scenario looks like. It consists of three parameters that are injected when the cluster is being set up. First is the traffic pattern, followed by the fail point, and then the cluster configuration. Traffic patterns or profiles are essentially traffic behavior that is injected into the cluster. It can be a high traffic scenario or a low traffic scenario, depending on the failure issue that we are trying to replicate. If the failure occurs only when there is high traffic, we set the traffic profile as high traffic. Next kind of failure is the like failure injection. Uh, etcd uses and maintains uh, go fail as a project which is designed to uh, force a failure at a certain intended stage go fail basically is added as a comment as we can see in the screenshot uh, within the code base at an intended step where we want it to fail as we see the snippet when we run go fail enable the comment is uh, expanded into the actual function. We can think of this function as a, a feature function with a feature flag turned off. And when we run the test, we actually turn this feature flag on via HTTP request so that the failure can be actually in uh, injected at that intended step. Once we are done with the test, we can simply run go fail disable, which will revert the expanded code back to that comment. It is a very nifty tool to enforce failures without having to worry about the failure function uh, having checked in. These fail points are uh, being used by Containerd uh, project as well as a different implementation. But the GoFail library itself is a very uh, capable one, which can be extended to any other projects that is there. Uh, then comes the cluster configuration, which actually uh, defines how the cluster is going to set up. 
So cluster configuration um, can be how many nodes you have. So it can be a single node cluster, it can be a, a three node cluster or a multi uh, node cluster. It also means that we can define which node will have which etcd version. So uh, different nodes, say three nodes in a cluster can have three different etcd versions and they can coexist. We can also uh, use the fail points that we discussed in the previous slide uh, to actually cut the communication between the nodes to imitate a, a network failure. So now that we are through with the input and setup, let's see how the input scenario actually looks in the code. So in the snippet that we have, uh, the name of the scenario is issue uh, 14370, which we are going to demo later in this uh, session. And then we have the uh, type of fail point that we want to inject, uh, the type of uh, traffic profile that we wanted to have, and the cluster configuration in which we want to replicate this scenario. Uh, over to Henry for the output and validation. Thank you. Um, so the whole uh, output collection and the validation part is actually uh, closely coupled with the library, open source library called Procupine. Uh, that's uh, what we have been using uh, for the robustness test. But you can definitely roll your own uh, tool uh, in your favorite programming language. Um, Procupine is basically a fast literalizability checker. And as you can see from the image, uh, this is the visualization that it will generate for your test run, which will help us uh, catch data inconsistency after uh, the whole operations uh, history has been run through, so we can quickly debug. There's a button, a jump to first arrow, and you can see how the uh, history has violated uh, the data, has, has the data inconsistency uh, being shown if you click on the jump to the first arrow. So like in this graph, we have three clients. Uh, client zero put a value, 200, and client one uh, tried to get it, and it got the value of 200. And client two tried to get the value, and it somehow get a different one. Maybe it's a stale value, or it's a value that just doesn't exist. And this uh, test library will quickly flag it out to you and all the history up to it, so you can quickly reproduce and maybe re-debug uh, the situation. So let's see how we are actually going to capture the history, which is basically the state of the system, and use it for validation. Uh, as we can see, the state for the key value store is something like a snapshot at the point of time where the keys and values are stored in the system. So as you can see on the screen, there are like four circles, basically are like the four states that kind of is representing the point of time. And like maybe on the very leftmost one, the state is basically there's one entry in the, system, the database and there's uh, the key A with the value one, so on and so forth for the rest of the three. And uh, in reality, what we actually collect uh, for the history is the replication history and also the states in the form of uh, porcupine operation. And the replication history, in our case, we actually take the write ahead log where the, is the, uh, rest, uh, the raft request is stored. So with both of these information, we will be able to infer the sequence uh, and the events from it. So now we can move on to validation. So as we have talked about states, and if we also introduce the state transitions, uh, then we will be able to come up with a state machine. Uh, and the state machine basically contains like the subset of features that we have identified to, uh, to test for. And if we implement the state machine correctly, it also will represent the desired behavior of the system. And what we mean by the transitions uh, are being shown here on the image. It's basically like the commands that we care about for testing. It's like the subset of feature that SCD actually supports. So as you can see here, maybe like the put and delete that we have mentioned, but we also have things like compact and defragment that we also model into the state machine. Why do we do a state machine though? Because it can actually serve as a ground truth, uh, ground truth for the validation for the output. So in a sense that uh, if we 
give the, uh, if we apply the input onto a real system and we keep all the state, then we can use it to compare, use the state machine to compare if the output is actually correct. And the steps that uh, we are, uh, the, in the transitions basically is the step in the Procupine library, which is where we did the implementation on. And so now with all these, we just need to take the history, we play on the model and check against the state machine. And if the request and response matches, then we could say the test has passed. Uh, there's one uh, note on modeling uh, the, the state machine. Basically, the request uh, in the perfect world will not fail, but in the realistic world, it will fail. So let's look at some illustrations. So the deterministic thing, which is like the perfect world, the transition is always one to one. So if we start from state uh, A equals to one, that basically means that the database currently only have one entry with value A, uh, with key A value one. And we try to put uh, key B value two into the system, then we will reach another state, which is A equals to one, B equals to two. And if we put A equals to three, that basically is the override, then we will have A equals to three, B equals to two, so on and so forth. And since everything doesn't arrow out, then like this is like the deterministic case. One, uh, one state with the transition will only reach the other. But since we were discussing about introducing failures, so even if we start as the same state, A equals to one, we put, uh, if we put B equals to two, we can reach the state that we have seen, A equals to one, B equals to two, but we can also reach a state where we are not sure if the value actually has been written to the system yet. So it's like we are pending. Then in this case, we need to model both states. And if we put another value in, we also need to model both states and reflect the states onto it. And we can only merge the states when maybe, like the case if the write, we're not sure if it has go through, like all of a sudden we know, okay, it has actually gone through, then we can merge, we can drop the arrow state down there, and we only keep the A equals to three, B equals to two state. But yeah, this is actually uh, the thing with non-deterministic model where your memory consumption might go exponential. So uh, we need to uh, keep in mind that uh, during, if we run this on CI, memory might be a uh, limitation. Um, what else can we do with all the state transitions? Beside, uh, beside using the tool, we can also add like consistency check within the internal data structures. Like as mentioned, for us, when we do compactions, uh, we want to make sure that the revision doesn't go back in time. Uh, these are the things that we don't, uh, if we can do the checks along the steps that we are taking, then uh, it will be also easier for us to make sure the, uh, the etcd is uh, operating as what we intended, uh, as intended. So to recap, we have four stages. From input, we define the scenarios. And then we, from the scenarios, we perform the setup. And then we take all the input and we apply it to the system. And then we collect the output, uh, which is the write ahead log, and also like the intermediate states in the Procupine operation. And then we perform the validation by cross-checking uh, uh, by cross-checking using our the model, the state machine model that we actually built, and then we're good. And it's time for demo, and I'll hand it over to Arka. Thanks, Henry. Uh, so now that we have uh, explained the end-to-end -end flow, uh, let's see it in action. So to start with, uh, we are actually uh, replicating the issue 14370. So you can see there is a make test robustness issue. So this is basically the test uh, code that we've written. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, and if you uh, see, it, it will be setting up the scenarios. It will be uh, setting up the traffic uh, profiles, the fail points, and so on. And uh, once it has run through, uh, the cluster and the fail points have been injected, we see that we are able to replicate that actual failure that has happened. Uh, now, let's look at the, um, let's, let's look at the uh, logs that it has created, basically the uh, watch and the uh, operation log that uh, Henry was talking about. So this is the directory in which it generates the uh, log. And uh, everything is in uh, JSON format. 
So let's look at the watch history. So if you see here, um, it consists of the operation type, it consists of the um, revision, and also the uh, type value that uh, it has for uh, this one. So this is basically the watch history for uh, this entire operation. Uh, now we will look at the operation history, which is also in the format of JSON. And yes, uh, so we'll be able to see uh, it also has the type of operation, the value, the um, revision. To, uh, so basically, the revision will ensure that uh, linearizability is maintained. And then finally, we will go to the uh, porcupine data, which is basically the graph that is generated uh, for us to track the states and also see the state transactions. So the porcupine data is um, generated as a f uh, HTML format. So here we can see uh, all the uh, states it has gone through throughout the process. So there is a combination of put, get, list statements with uh, the revision for each one. And uh, as we can see, this is the first error. We are jumping to the first error. And this is the point where uh, it has diverged. And uh, there, there, this is the point of the inconsistency. This is where it has failed. And if you see, uh, there are uh, multiple revisions with the same uh, revision number which basically uh, says that, OK, linearizability has not been respected. So this is basically uh, what we wanted to detect as a part of the uh, entire uh, reproducibility uh, and error testing thing. And that brings us to the end of this demo. So let's see at the key takeaways that we have. So in uh, distributed systems, we should definitely expect real world disruptions like network latency, uh, any kind of uh, hardware flakiness. And we should actually try to incorporate those as a testing uh, module. Then is introducing randomness to your system. So these are the failures that we have discussed. We want to introduce this kind of randomness to test our system so that it doesn't break in uh, real life. So basically fuzzing that we discussed, it just doesn't cut it because it is not checking for correctness or the linearizability. Next is you can use uh, etcd as a guide to kickstart your robustness testing um, journey. And uh, since uh, we had the robustness test framework and it has been evolving throughout the years, Right now, it is very consistent and prompt uh, to identify any kind of um, inconsistency issues. You can see uh, all those in action uh, in the issues of the uh, etcd, and you can come and contribute to it. And etcd as a project has become more resilient with the uh, robustness taste framework because uh, it, uh, there has been many issues that has been uncovered using that. And over the years, we have been able to fix those. And right now, it is a very dependable key value store for mission critical systems. And that brings us to the end of our session. Uh, thank you. And this is the QR to the uh, robustness uh, test uh, readme, which you can uh, actually scan to get and start with your robustness test journey. Thank you. Uh, we are open to questions. Hi. Uh, thanks for the uh, interesting session. I think uh, I understand this is your design for ETCD, but it can be used for other applications. But when I think in that, so there may be key challenges how we can design the state machine for the uh, application we want to test. So uh, can you share some like, uh, tips or tricks to design or testing the uh, state machine itself to make sure that it, it can kind of properly reflect the uh, target application behavior? Uh, yeah, so basically, this is specific to etcd because it has been already implemented. But uh, for 
any application, uh, I guess uh, I'm just repeating the question for the uh, audience, uh, you want tips and tricks where you can do the same kind of modeling for any other application that you are doing. So basically the first thing is to identify the failures that can happen as a part of your application when it's running on distributed systems. Also basically those which are not very easily reproducible. And uh, once you get those parameters uh, where it is able to reproduce, where in what situation you are able to reproduce, you need to write the model. You can take the etcd code base of like robustness test as a reference and uh, like replicate it using those uh, profiles, so like heavy traffic or uh, he heavy write, read write, uh, or some kind of like node node failure. So these are the fail points. Again, you can uh, write yourselves and inject it into your code to test it, to reproduce that particular scenario. OK. Yeah. Uh, to add on to it, um, we actually have something that we call the, the Kubernetes contract. Because etcd is, uh, the biggest user of etcd is actually Kubernetes. So during the time we developed the robustness test, actually we f took a step back. We actually, on the Kubernetes side, we, we look into what actually are the features that the Kubernetes are asking for etcd. So, because Etsy have more features that Kubernetes are actually using. So you kind of have to define a contract first. So you have like a subset of API, or for those API, how do you actually use it? Like for the compaction, we don't actually compact on every key. There's like periodic compaction or something like that. So you kind of model that first, then uh, with the failure that Arka was saying, and then you can also, from the contract, you kind of have an idea of maybe what kind of traffic pattern you are expecting. So you kind of start building the picture of how real use cases might be, and then you go from there, uh, from like those things that you kind of know. And then you can already discover, discover quite some things, maybe just already database kind of broken or something that from, from that. It's like writing unit tests, right? You kind of start with a simple case that you know, and then you encounter more, then you add more. So that's kind of how we get started with it. OK, yep. thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I think that's it. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy Tokyo. Enjoy Tokyo. Have a nice evening. Yep. Bye-bye.